and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Welcome to tonight's Grace Study Hour webinar. I am your host, Charles Smoot, author of Fallen from Grace, Understanding the Theology of Grace, The Dangers of Legalism, and the Three Phases of Apostasy, which is now available as a complimentary second edition to all of our webinar attendees at our website www.gracestudyhour.org that's gracestudyhour.org we want to welcome you to part two of our study of the two coverings a struggle between law and grace and it is always good to see our Facebook family our local Lancaster supporters and our new guests that are on the webinar tonight ladies and gentlemen we're going to get right into our material this evening and we're going to move along now you may want to review the first part of this study to bring yourself up to speed we will not be covering the old the, the material that we've already covered but it laid a foundation for what we're going to share tonight and so if you were not with us last week you definitely want to go to our YouTube channel or retrieve the video from the link in emails that we have sent out over the past couple of days and so tonight ladies and gentlemen we're going to pick up from where we left off with the subheading grace in the garden grace in the garden now ladies and gentlemen by way of introduction We want to begin by saying that Adam was the first legalist in the Bible. Adam was the first legalist in the Bible. However, Adam did not remain a legalist. He was converted from his legalism to embrace faith in the substitution and atonement of the blood sacrifice and so let's talk just a little bit about uh, the fact that Adam began his relationship with God in a state of perfection and innocence and from that perfection and innocence ladies and gentlemen through transgression, through crossing over a boundary that God had set for him, Adam became a transgressor and a sinner. One who missed or has missed the mark. And so Adam, because of his disobedience, to the revealed will of God because of his disobedience to what we call the law of the garden because of his disobedience to the Edenic covenant the covenant that God made with man from the very beginning in the garden of Eden because Adam chose to disobey God sin entered the world and the penalty for sin which is death and so Adam and Eve devised a 
a way to cover their sin, which was ultimately rejected by God. Now, what did they do? They devised a way to sew fig leaves together and to make aprons. Why did they do this? Because their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. It is believed that Adam and Eve were originally clothed with light, but that when the sin occurred in their lives and they fell from their first state of innocence, they began to look at each other and they realized that they were naked. They had no covering. And they were afraid. They experienced fear. They experienced guilt. And they experienced shame. And so they devised a covering of fig leaves, which they sewed together. So this covering was actually the works of their own hands, and it represents the concept of works. And so when God confronted them and they owned up to their sin, when they confessed their sin, God took from them the covering that they fashioned through the works of their own hands, and he gave them a covering that was acceptable to God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, religion is man's attempt or man's effort to perform duties to his creator that he believes will give him the favor and the blessing of God. But ladies and gentlemen, religion does not save you. Religion does not save me. You see, we're not allowed or encouraged in scripture to come up with our own remedy or to contrive our own salvation. However, we are taught in Scripture that God alone is the source of our salvation, and He has so designed our salvation, ladies and gentlemen so that you and I cannot receive righteousness based on our own works. And so Adam was the first legalist who was converted. He was actually converted from works to faith. Now it's interesting how that throughout the Bible we see men departing from faith to embrace works, to embrace justification, salvation, and eternal life and security with God based on their own performance or their own merit. And we will see consistently throughout Scripture, not only in the Garden of Eden, we can find it in at the offering or the altar of Cain and Abel, 
We can find it at the Tower of Babel. We can see how man always tries to climb up some other way. He always departs from faith to works. But we also see how God always requires man to repent from dead works of self-righteousness and to embrace faith toward God. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the righteousness of God, the scripture tells us, is not revealed from faith to works or from works to works. But the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So what is a legalist? What is a legalist? Well, ladies and gentlemen, a legalist is one who seeks to obtain God's favor and blessing through the keeping of the law or other man-made doctrines, disciplines, or rules in order that he might obtain righteousness with God and through that secure for himself God's favor, his blessings, and in the end salvation and eternal life. And so, ladies and gentlemen, legalism is simply righteousness through human merit. It is justification through human merit. It is sanctification through human merit. It is preservation or eternal security through human merit. And so, in order for us to be able to embrace the concept of righteousness through faith, human merit, must be excluded from the equation. And that is why Paul writes in Ephesians when he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if God had accepted Adam on the basis of his works, then Adam would have had an occasion to boast in his works of self-righteousness. But God rejected the covering of fig leaves and he gave them another covering that was acceptable to God. And that covering, ladies and gentlemen, was the coats of skins. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, ladies and gentlemen, their eyes were opened and man's conscience was awakened. And for the first time, Adam and Eve experienced guilt, shame, condemnation and fear. Why? Because they fell from their state of innocence and now they were transgressors. They were sinners. And the result of sin, ladies and gentlemen, is guilt, shame, condemnation, and fear. So these were the immediate spiritual consequences of transgressing the law of the garden. And ladies and gentlemen, there are spiritual consequences of transgressing God's law and being disobedient 
to the revealed will of God, there are always consequences. Now, Adam's first response was to hide himself from God. We see that. Now, since the law of the garden provided no remedy for sin, Adam fashioned a covering with his own hands and he chose fig leaves. Adam did not realize, however, that even though he had fallen and even though he failed and even though he was guilty and even though he was under the penalty of death for violating the law of the garden, Adam did not realize that things did not spiral out of control to the extent that God could not intervene. And ladies and gentlemen, your life may be in a state of upheaval. It may be in a state of confusion. You may be in despair. You may be discouraged. You may be disappointed. You may be frustrated with where you are. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that God is one big step, one giant step ahead of you, and he is going to work it out so that it is for your good and so that it is for his glory. Adam had no way of knowing about God's divine plan of redemption. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has a plan of redemption for your life. God has a plan of redemption for your situation. God has a plan of making the crooked things in your life straight, making the rough places of your life smooth. God has a plan, ladies and gentlemen, that transcends your understanding and mine. But God has a plan to which he is now committed. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Adam was about to receive his first lesson in grace theology. What is grace theology? Now, I'm going to give you a definition that you will have to break it down. But grace theology, ladies and gentlemen, is simply the systematic interpretation of the doctrines of grace and their redemptive application in the life of a believer through the finished work of the substitution and atonement of Christ at Calvary. Now that says a lot and we're going to have to chew on that for a while. But Adam is about to receive his first lesson in grace theology. Now, when we say that we can find grace in the garden, ladies and gentlemen, we mean exactly that. Even in the midst of failure, even in the midst of this horrific sin and departure from God's perfect will for their lives, God had a plan and that plan is through his grace. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. So when we say we can find grace in the garden, we mean that in the Garden of Eden, ladies and gentlemen, we have the source, we have the bedrock 
we have the cornerstone upon which New Testament salvation is firmly secured. We understand this because grace, ladies and gentlemen, is not predicated on the principle of works. Grace is not predicated on the principle of justification through human merit. But grace, ladies and gentlemen, is predicated and built upon these two principles, the principles of substitution and atonement, which is often presented as substitutionary atonement. But I like to separate the two principles because they are presented to us in type and shadow throughout the Bible and revealed to us as substitution and atonement. For instance, in the New Testament, when Jesus says, this is my body which is broken for you, he's talking about the principle of substitution. When Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, he's talking about the principle of atonement. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the cup and the bread individually represent the two principles of substitution and atonement. And so, ladies and gentlemen, grace is predicated on the principles of substitution and atonement. Now, the word grace is translated in the Greek from the word charis. And that word simply means gift. So anything that proceeds from the gift is part of or flows from the gift. So it is a gift. Any benefit that flows from the gift is also of grace. And so what is grace? Grace is the free gift of God's unmerited favor. Grace is favor, ladies and gentlemen, without merit. It means that it's God's favor that he gives to you freely without conditions on your part. It is without your goodness, without your merit, without you being worthy, without you demonstrating that you deserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, grace is not something that we deserve. Grace is something that we receive from God through Jesus Christ. So grace is the free gift of God's unmerited favor that brings with it a divine benefit of a sort to undeserving people to help them during a time of need. And that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve embraced legalism, fashioning the fig leaves of their own hands. Ladies and gentlemen, grace came walking in the garden in the cool of the day and said, where art thou? You see, ladies and gentlemen, grace is God coming to you where you are and meeting your need where you are. God met Adam and Eve in the garden and ladies and gentlemen, there was only one reason why God met them there. It was because he sought them out. He sought them out. And ladies and gentlemen, he designed and 
He became the architect of a salvation, ladies and gentlemen, that is so wonderful. It is beyond our understanding. Grace, ladies and gentlemen, is in the garden. Why? Because we can find the principles of substitution and atonement there. So after acknowledging and openly confessing his sin before God, Adam's self-made, self-righteous covering was rejected. Did. God said, I don't want your best, Adam, because your best is not good enough. I don't want your righteousness, Adam, because it is not good enough. It is not sufficient. And God rejected the covering of fig leaves just as he rejected Cain's sacrifice of the fruit of the ground, just as he rejected Nimrod's attempt to build the tower that would reach to heaven. Now, why was it rejected, ladies and gentlemen? It was rejected because Adam fashioned Adam fashioned his covering contrary to the principles of substitution and atonement. You see, Adam's apron of fig leaves was the disappointing result of his own righteous efforts or works. And God will always be disappointed when you seek to be justified through your own merit rather than embrace the principles of substitution and atonement that are embodied in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And so likewise, the legalist must come to the understanding that God will never accept any covering for sin that does not fully embody the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And ladies and gentlemen, finished work means exactly that. It means what Jesus said to tell us die, it is finished. And you and I can only approach God through the merit of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You and I can only be justified and find favor with God through the merit of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You and I can only have eternal life and eternal security, not based on what we do, not based on our obedience, not based on our enduring to the end, not based on our anything. Ladies and gentlemen, it is solely based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so the legalist must come to this understanding. That it is grace plus nothing. That it is faith plus nothing. That it is the cross plus nothing. Now, does the covering God gave to Adam and Eve reflect the redemptive theology of grace and the principles of substitution and atonement? Well, let's take a closer look at the two coverings. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at Adam's covering compared to God's covering, here's what we find. Well, Adam's covering was of fig leaves, while God's covering was coats of skins. Adam's coverings was the work of Adam. 
God's covering was the work of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, your works cannot save you. Your fig leaves cannot save you. Salvation is not the work of man. Salvation is the work of God, and it is entirely the work of God, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You see, your works as Adam's covering will be rejected by God. But God will accept you on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, Adam took part in fashioning his salvation or his, his covering, if you will, of the fig leaves. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, Adam did not take part in the providing the covering of the coats of skins. You see, Adam could boast in that which he took part in. He could take glory and credit for that which he fashioned with his own hands. But ladies and gentlemen, Adam, just as you and I, took no part in what happened at Calvary. We can boast not. We cannot take any credit or any glory for what God did in Christ at Calvary. You see, in Adam's covering, ladies and gentlemen, the principle of substitution was absent. But in God's covering, ladies and gentlemen, in this New Testament salvation that we enjoy, the principle of substitution is present. The principle of substitution simply says that Jesus Christ offered himself without spot. He offered himself in your place and on your behalf. God substituted his son to die for the penalty that you justly deserve. God substituted his son in my place to take upon himself the judgment that I deserve. You see, Adam's covering, the principle of atonement was absent. But in God's covering, ladies and gentlemen, the principle of atonement is present. And the principle of atonement simply means that because of the vicarious substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, because of the shedding of his blood and through the shedding of his blood, through the offering up of himself and the shedding of his blood, he covered and atoned for my sin, ladies and gentlemen. And now it is expiated. It is gone. It is gone. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Adam had faith in his works. He had faith in his works. He put faith in the merit of his own effort. But God rejects that, ladies and gentlemen. You see, your faith and my faith cannot be in that which we have done. <coughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Your faith and my faith cannot be in our obedience. It cannot be... in our own merit. But ladies and gentlemen, our faith must and forever point away from ourselves and it must be pointed to the only one, the only person, the only sacrifice, the only begotten Son of God and it, and it must be in His blood. It must be in His finished work of the cross. 
And so, ladies and gentlemen, while Adam's covering was of fig leaves, the work of his own hands, God's covering of skins was the work of God alone. While Adam's covering of works was rejected by God, while God's covering of skins was accepted, Adam took no part in providing his covering of fig leaves. I'm sorry, Adam took part in providing his covering of fig leaves. But Adam did nothing to secure or make sure for himself the covering of skins. Adam had no part whatsoever in the sacrifice of atonement made by God himself. Adam's works were not part of the process and were not taken into account. It was all the work of God himself. And ladies and gentlemen, just as we see these things in type and shadow in the Old Testament, the principles carry over, ladies and gentlemen, into the New Testament. And what can be said of Adam can be said of us today, and what can be said of God can be said of God today. You see, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Adam covering, Adam's covering in no way demonstrated and provided for the principles of substitution and atonement. However, God's covering provided for and demonstrated the principles of substitution and atonement. Adam's covering demonstrated that he had faith only in his own works. God's covering demonstrated Adam's faith was only in the blood atonement. And that's why we say that Adam was converted from legalism to faith, to grace, to believing in grace. You see, Adam had faith and works. However, at first, his faith was misplaced. And this is where we have to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, because just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean that your faith is in the right place. You see, you can call yourself a Christian, but your faith can be in your own works. It's not what you call yourself, ladies and gentlemen. You see, Adam soon repented of his dead works of self-righteousness, removed his fig leaves, and by receiving the coats of skins, he and his wife Eve, openly expressed his newfound faith in the blood atonement. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when you and I go down in the waters of baptism, it is because we have faith in the finished work of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are then enjoined into that work, ladies and gentlemen. Now, water baptism does not save us. What saves us, ladies and gentlemen, is our faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ at Calvary. But it is an outward expression of that faith. Faith in works or faith in the blood? This is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Because like Adam, the legalist insists that he must participate to some degree in his salvation. But ladies and gentlemen, to that extent that you rely on some aspect of your merit to be saved and eternally secure, to that extent you steal and rob 
from the glory of God. To what extent that you boast or take credit for your righteous standing before God and your eternal security, to that extent, ladies and gentlemen, you steal and rob from the glory of God. But ladies and gentlemen, remember that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not, and that not, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works not of works. It's not your obedience. It's not your consecration. It's not your prayer life. It's not how much you give to the church. It's not how often you fast. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you and I cannot participate in any degree in our salvation because if we did, we could thereby take credit for that. All we can do, ladies and gentlemen, is like Adam, we can reject our own works, reject our own merit, and then receive the merit, and the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, the legalist believes that his righteous works or his merit must also be taken into account before he can be eternally saved and justified before God. It is here that the legalist must be careful and repent for he is standing on unholy ground. He is not alone, however, because others such as the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and others, you see, they have faith and they have works. But their faith is in their works. And ladies and gentlemen, if your faith is in your works, you have missed the mark. If your faith is in your works, your performance, your actions, your lifestyle, you have missed the mark and you have embraced legalism. And ladies and gentlemen, legalism is a dangerous, a dangerous phenomenon in the body of Christ. And you need to be careful and you need to repent because your faith and my faith should only be in the sacrifice and atonement of Jesus Christ and his merit alone. So don't be fooled by the mere presence of faith and works in a person's life, because it is not enough to ask if the believer is justified by faith or by works. Neither is it enough to recognize the existence of both faith and works in the life of the believer. We must delve deeper to resolve the question. In whom or in what does my faith reside? You see, ladies and gentlemen, two brothers came to an altar to present an offering to God. One brought the firstlings of his flock. The other brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. But ladies and gentlemen, the one who brought the offering 
of the fruit of the ground was rejected along with his offering. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, remember what we said, God will not accept an offering or a sacrifice for sin that does not embody the principles of substitution and atonement. And that can only be found in a sacrifice where blood is shed. And so, ladies and gentlemen, your faith cannot be in yourself. Your faith cannot be in yourself. Your faith cannot be in yourself. Your faith has to be in another. It has to be in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the propitiation for your sin. And so God rejected Cain and he received Abel because Abel's offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And because of it, he obtained witness that he was righteous because his righteousness, ladies and gentlemen, was based and predicated on the substitution and atonement of the blood offering. Where is the believer's faith supposed to be rooted and grounded? Now, is it in our works of righteousness or is it in the blood of the Lamb? Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him, the beast, the Antichrist, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. You see, ladies and gentlemen, our faith has to be in the blood of the Lamb. That's how we overcome. The first promise of redemption through grace is given in the book of Genesis. Now, in theology, we refer to it as the Proto-Evangelicum or the Proto-Evangelium which simply means the first good news. The first gospel, ladies and gentlemen, is given to us in Genesis 3, chapter 15, and it declares, listen, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, ladies and gentlemen, way back at the dawn of man's history, God had a plan in motion that through his son Jesus Christ he would destroy or bring to naught or nullify or make void the works of the devil. This is the very first gospel, ladies and gentlemen, the first good news. What is the good news? The good news is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that it is a finished work. 
Hallelujah. Now, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, there are some who believe that God clothed Adam and Eve with the decaying skin of animals that died of natural causes. Furthermore, some believe that Adam and Eve died in their sin and were lost. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when you come to conclusions such as this, it means that you do not understand what happened in the garden. You do not understand the principles of substitution and atonement and how they were applied to the life of Adam and Eve. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely absurd. Why? Because it is no mystery that God clothed Adam and Eve with the coats of skins. And these were not the skins of animals that died of natural causes, ladies and gentlemen, because every sacrifice has to be a living sacrifice, not a dead one. Every sacrifice unto God has to be a living sacrifice. And that's why the Bible tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was a living sacrifice. He died on the cross, ladies and gentlemen. He shed his blood and exchanged it for you and for me. And so it is no mystery that God clothed Adam and Eve with coats of skins, and these were the skins of a spotless, innocent, and very much alive lamb. No doubt the stain of blood was fresh upon them when God presented them a covering for their nakedness, their shame, and the guilt which they bore. But ladies and gentlemen, that is what he did because the Bible tells us, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. We know that in the eternal purpose of God, the sacrifice of Christ was predestined before Adam had even fallen. How do we know this? Because the scripture says of Jesus, in Acts 2 and verse 23, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the plan of redemption was no secret to God, it was part of his eternal purpose. It was not an afterthought, ladies and gentlemen. It was a forethought because God is omniscient. He knows all things at all times from the beginning of creation until the end. He is omniscient and God knew that Adam would fail. God knew that a sacrifice for sin would have to be made. God knew these things from the very beginning, ladies and gentlemen. And so John the Revelator writes that Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Peter declares of Christ, who verily was foreordained, foreappointed, appointed before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, revealed, declared, made known in these last times for you. And so John the Baptist cried in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away 
the sin of the world. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, it was no less an act of divine grace in the garden when God shed the blood of the innocent to atone for the sin of the guilty. Why? Because grace demanded a sacrifice. And that sacrifice had to be the blood of one who was innocent in order to atone for the sin of the guilty. In order for you and I to be able to approach God Our merit had to be excluded from the process because our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. We are all as an unclean thing. But there is one who was worthy to take the book and to loosen the seals thereof. John said, I looked. Behold, it was a lamb as it had been slain. And he said, I cried and said, Who is worthy to take the book and to loose the seals thereof? And he said, I wept not. He said, I wept much because there was no man worthy. There was no man worthy. The angel said, Weep not, John, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And ladies and gentlemen, because of the blood of that innocent lamb, because of the Son of God, we receive His righteousness, which allows us to be able to boldly approach the throne of grace. And so contrary to what some legalists believe, brothers and sisters, Adam and Eve were not lost. God, through Christ, did all the necessary works to provide Adam and Eve with an atonement, the coats of the skins of an innocent. It cost them nothing. They made no contribution whatsoever. And ladies and gentlemen, you nor I can make any contribution whatsoever to our own salvation. They did not have to work for it, earn it, or maintain it. They had only to believe and receive the covering that God provided for them. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if you are working, trying to earn your way to heaven, if you think that you can maintain your salvation, you are mistaken. You couldn't do anything to get saved, and you can't do anything to stay saved. You don't begin in the spirit and then are made perfect by the flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, this work of God is of, by, and through the spirit of God and has nothing to do with your merit. This proves once again that God's principle of substitution and atonement operates only through the principle of grace. And this principle, ladies and gentlemen, is consistent throughout scripture from the very first book in the Bible to the very last book in the Bible. If we have learned anything from the lesson of Adam and Eve, my brothers and sisters, we will be careful to reject any form of legalism 
and the false doctrine of salvation through human merit because it is a gospel of works. It is not a gospel of faith. Legalism, ladies and gentlemen, is a gospel of human merit. So Adam, as have many since, he may have started down the road of legalism and self-righteousness through works, but he turned around and became a grace believer. He turned around, ladies and gentlemen, and became a grace believer. And grace, once again, is the free gift of God's unmerited favor. Now, I want to say this, and I'm done. If you're listening and you are entangled in the mire of legalism, if you've been taught, if you teach, that you must be baptized with water or you cannot be saved. You are adding your merit to the finished work of cross, of the cross. Water baptism is a sign, it is a token of the new covenant that exists between God and the New Testament believer. It is a token of the covenant, even as circumcision was a sign and a token of the covenant that existed between God and Abraham. But ladies and gentlemen, before the circumcision was even given to Abraham, he was already justified by faith. And ladies and gentlemen, before you go down in the water of baptism, you are already justified by faith because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation you see ladies and gentlemen believers are baptized not to be saved but because they are saved believers are baptized not to be in the covenant but because they are already in a covenant relationship the righteousness precedes the token of circumcision. The righteousness precedes the token of water baptism. Water baptism, ladies and gentlemen, is a New Testament command, and every believer should be baptized with water. But ladies and gentlemen, water does not save you. The blood of Jesus saves you. Water doesn't wash away your sins. Your sins are washed away, ladies and gentlemen, by calling on the name of the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if you're listening to my voice tonight and you've been taught or you teach that a believer can walk away from his salvation and be lost. Then you are teaching righteousness through merit. You see, ladies and gentlemen, salvation has never been in your hand or my hand to walk away from it, to give it up, to throw it away. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and he that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Jesus said, 
and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, nor out of my Father's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation is not yours to throw away. It's not a shiny new toy that you can just take back to Kmart and get a refund. Ladies and gentlemen, you have passed from death to life, and you cannot pass from life back to death. And so I implore you today to ask God to show you that your security is in Christ, not in yourself. God love you. Thank you. I know that we went a little bit over, but ladies and gentlemen, I believe I've obeyed God tonight. I want to thank you for being on this broadcast, and we're going to take questions in just a minute. But dear friends and guests, this ministry operates strictly on faith. And if this webinar has been a blessing to you, your gift will help us to reach others with the message of grace and the finished work of the cross. You may visit our website and select the PayPal donation button at www.gracestudyhour.org. We want to thank you for your support and your prayers. And ladies and gentlemen, whether you give or not, it doesn't matter to me because I am doing what God told me to do and I will continue to do it as he gives me the grace. But ladies and gentlemen, we do appreciate you so much. We thank you for your prayers. We pray for you. We lift you up before God and we ask that you continue to lift this ministry up and invite a guest to come on the, the broadcast. Uh, of our webinar next week. You can always invite um, guests to come on the broadcast simply by forwarding uh, your invitation emails to them. Um, please, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat box. And if you have a comment or two you'd like to put uh, into the chat box as well, that would be fine. And we're going to go ahead and leave this up for just a minute while we uh, take questions. God love you.